welcome everyone. Please continue to stand by and we'll get started at the top of the hour. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Alicia McKeeby with the innovation team here at Core.ai. And on behalf of Core.ai and in collaboration with Workplace by Facebook, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar, Entering the Conversational Era, the why, what, and how of bringing dialogue to your digital strategy with chatbots. By way of housekeeping, throughout the webinar, as you have questions, please submit using the Q&A window. And at the end of the presentation, we'll field as many questions as time allows or simply follow up afterwards. If you're unable to see the Q&A window, hover over the floating WebEx toolbar to gain access. We will also send a copy of today's presentation to you tomorrow. Presenting today is Lindsay Sanchez, Core.ai's Head of Strategic Operations and CMO. Lindsay is an industry technology expert helping business leaders identify bottom line value and turning the ways customers and employees traditionally engage with technology into natural human-like interactions, making it easier for them to engage conversationally, get more done, and come back for more. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thanks, Alicia. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Um, as Alicia mentioned, my name is Lindsay Sanchez. I'm the Head of Strategic Operations and CMO at CORE. Um, we're thrilled to have those of you who could join us live today, and a big thanks and welcome, especially to those Workplace by Facebook customers that have made it to today's session. For those not familiar with Core.ai, just a very quick introduction. We're a 150-person company that's been in business for about three years. Since our inception, our mission has really been the same, and that's been very simply to drive forward a conversational AI-first era that we believe will make digital feel simpler, faster, and more human. The way in which we do this is by allowing enterprises to build highly in for what we've seen as the thousands of employee, customer, and partner-facing use cases that we believe will have a major impact on both people and on businesses. Behind our vision of AI-powered chatbots at enterprise scale, what we did is we built a true end-to-end -end platform on which enterprises can design, deploy, and manage these chatbots in a way that we believe is going to be as scalable and as much ha have the same amount of staying power as other so enterprise software models have had in the past. As one of the Workplace by Facebook chatbot development partners as well, we're continuing to work together to try to make the way in which people interact with systems as natural, intuitive, and efficient as collaboration has become with technologies like Workplace by Facebook in the person-to-person -person communication arena. So in the next 40 minutes, what I'll cover is why the conversational era has emerged and what we see as the primary digital challenge driving this movement, why we believe now is an opportune time for a major shift how chatbots address the challenges of today's digital era, 
And then what I'll do to wrap up for the last 20 minutes of it will be to walk through three very specific pieces of advice that we provide to our enterprise customers. And they're all based on lessons we've learned working with more than 50 of the largest global companies and in creating ourselves more than 150 pre-built chatbots for some of the largest enterprise systems such as Salesforce, some of the major SAP systems, ServiceNow, and others. So with that, let me go ahead and get started. So what is the conversational era? As you likely have read in the news, industry experts have actually said that we're formally entering a new era. When I look at this, I think that from 2010 to now, the major drivers of our digital strategies have really been mobile and cloud, designed for optimal mobile end user experiences, build on the cloud. And while we see that some of our customers have not necessarily moved to a, a full cloud, they are even building private cloud environments that look a lot like the public clouds that are out there. And while those trends we believe are still absolutely a critical part of our digital future, they're not going away by any means, they've also paved the way for this new conversational AI first digital era. So what is that era? When we look at the definition, very simply put, we define it as a time in which people, companies, systems, and even smart internet enabled machines can interact with each other in exactly the same way people talk to friends and even colleagues and that's through an intelligent conversation. With the advent of intelligence layered on top of conversational interfaces, systems can also be smart enough to adapt and respond to individuals' needs or behaviors, to execute tasks even independently of people, and to communicate with other systems and machines in a way that they never previously could. And there's a good reason we believe for this shift to happen, one that I think that we all probably experience in our daily life, and that's very simply complexity. I recently read a, a statement in an article that so perfectly for me articulated the challenge associated with complexity. It was an SAP executive who said, complexity is the most intractable, intractable issue of our time, an epidemic of wide-ranging proportions affecting our lives, our work, and even our health. We can, we can all relate to that. Um, I personally thought about this yesterday when I wasted 10 minutes late in the evening last night searching for that single document that contained that powerful quote that I wanted to use today. I also felt it two weeks ago when at midnight, leaving Fort Lauderdale, my flight had, hadn't taken off due to weather delays. And after 30 minutes waiting on the phone for an airline rep to get on just to tell me that I wouldn't be able to get to my destination for another two days, I wondered why I couldn't have done that digitally. Why couldn't I have gone to the airline's website and just asked the question of, are there any other options for me to get to Austin, Texas? So when you think about complexity, we all have those personal experiences that we um, feel in our everyday lives. But one of the, the pieces of information that struck me the most is that the 200 biggest companies in the world are actually losing over 10% of their annual profit because of complexity. That's over $237 billion. What's more of a conundrum out of that is that the same, the complexity and the in, inefficiency that we face today is largely driven by systems that have made our, our businesses run in a modern world. Because unfortunately, when you start to get up into some of the bigger companies, just the sheer number of applications that people have to deal with in their day-to-day -day lives gets greater instead of simpler. So you see, there's an average of about 36 applications that is expected to be used in an enterprise that has one billion in revenue. Multiply that up to a 400 billion in revenue company and you've got something on you know, the, the side of 14,000 applications that people are using. That's a real challenge. Well, if you look at the conversational era in and of itself, it's meant to address this problem. And luckily, we're well positioned to make now the right time for this digital change to happen because there's been a confluence of things that are happening related to data wealth and the availability of data as a whole the technology and infrastructure that's at people's hands and the demand from an end user perspective that makes it possible for us to actually change what our digital future will look like. So let's go through those trends that are driving the opportunity for conversational AI. 
first data, data wealth or the sheer abundance of data that has continued to be produced due to the rapid growth of internet and digital. In fact, I, I also read recently that in the past two years alone that we've created more data than in the history of the entire human race. And while that data is still abundant, it's still also largely untapped. They say less than 0.5% of data is ever analyzed or used. I'm sure most of the people that are sitting on the phone can think about all of the data internally within your business and how accessing and using that data would be able to change the outcomes of your business, of specific processes that you have, of customer experiences. So that data wealth is, is huge. It has an immense amount of potential for us going forward. The good part is that from an infrastructure perspective, we're also in a place where new technologies can come in. The cost, the capacity, and the processing power of our infrastructure, both when you think about what's in the public cloud, and as I mentioned before, even with enterprises' own data centers or private clouds, we're really at a place where the capacity and scale has reached so high and the cost so low, whether we're talking about servers and storage, to the processors that are now powerful enough to consume large quantities of video, images, and other data, bandwidth as a commodity in and of itself, but also with the advent of APIs, the basic building blocks of data sharing, we are at a point where that data can be more easily extracted and used in a totally different way than it ever has before. These APIs themselves are opening the door for data that was once tied to just a single system to be able to not only interact within that system, but to be able to be accessed and exchanged from common user interfaces or channels such as Workplace by Facebook. But last and most importantly, when you think about what's driving the conversational era and the, the need to address this complexity factor, it's really people. And again, I think we can all relate to this in our personal lives if we start to think about what's happening or what surrounds us. I personally go to my, to my life itself and, and look at the trends that are happening by watching my, my kids. I've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old who are up on the screen here. And when you think about the way in which they're getting accustomed to using technology, it's not just kids, it's not just the millennial generation, but it's even people that are um, moving into their retirement age. People have started to expect that messaging and collaboration tools are the predominant form of communication. I, I jokingly state that, you know, my kids don't even understand what email is. All they know is, you know, text message and social media, and that's the way people communicate. People are getting more familiar with smart speech-enabled sites. Um, the fact that you can use speech when you're searching for something. Virtual assistants like Siri have become commonplace, and now we're seeing the growth of speech-enabled devices come right into the home at a dizzying pace of growth. If you flip over to why, um, I found this, this statistic very, very interesting for the drive and the need to move towards speech as a key element of how people will communicate, and that's that humans can speak 150 words per minute versus type 40 words per minute. So that basically means you can get things done when you're speaking three times faster than you can if you're typing. So obviously there's great opportunity there for speech, but it's actually happening as well. So 40% of people today are already using voice search at least once per day. I pay attention a lot when I'm traveling in the airport to how many people are also talking to Siri or using voice to text when they're going over to, to message a friend or do something and whether they're comfortable with that in a more public environment. But ultimately, when you look at this, together this problem of complexity mixed with the confluence of data that's more accessible with infrastructure that is powerful, cheap, and can be used to get to that data and users demand, and the truth is that they've already found a simpler and faster way. So you look at companies like Facebook, like Amazon, they're changing the experiences that we all have on a day-to-day -day basis with technology. We're all very quickly going to come to expect 
just like in the era in which employees came to expect that we could bring our own devices into the workplace and there would be mobile apps that are as simple as what we use in the consumer world for the business world, people are gonna expect much of the same in the conversational era, even in the enterprise world. They're going to see that it's, it's faster to use voice to text than it always is to um, text or type. They're gonna get comfortable with these messaging mediums as the way in which they interact. And we see this as the opportunity that's really opened the door for the fact that the conversational AI first era is coming into play. So let's talk a little bit about what are chatbots specifically. Chatbots are really this smart intermediary between people with the demands that I just described that they have and the systems that they need to use to get their jobs done. But chatbots as designed right can also be the interface between one system and another. They can trigger workflows across multiple systems that engage people and sometimes don't. There's been a lot of talk in the news about chatbots being um, a, a thing that is going to necessarily replace a lot of humans in the workforce. I think we're still far from that in a lot of cases, but chatbots can be the intermediary, but intermediary between automation and workflows that still require people. And again, across these multiple systems, because when you think about those enterprises that get really, really large and the complexity of the system environment, one of the greatest challenges is that those systems do not talk today, which oftentimes will create manual workflows and processes or people that need to step in to do really low level jobs just to get the data exchanged between two different systems. AI rich chatbots can be that intermediary in which people can use technologies like voice to text in the communica communication channels that they prefer, which is really the mission of um, workplace by Facebook is to bring a, you know, a medium, a communication medium that everyone is comfortable with in their consumer lives into the workplace and allow people to talk to these complex enterprise systems that you as a business rely on to have your business operate effectively and efficiently and to get the data that you need to continue to drive the business forward, but let them engage in a way that's simple and intuitive and natural to them. So breaking AI rich chatbots down one level further, we look at AI powered chatbots as theory like assistants that are purpose built in the enterprise world for specific tasks that people can engage through a conversational user interface. A lot of people will say the conversational interface is no interface at all because it's the same interface that you use to talk to people using modern tools like Workplace through speech or text where you can speak in, in natural language, but we've also seen a lot of companies incorporate some UI elements when a UI like a button um, or a calendar could pop up because it's gonna be faster to complete a task if that UI element is included. From an intelligence perspective, the way that we think about chatbots or an AI rich chatbot is it needs to A, be able to understand natural language. That means it has to be able to translate and parse what a human says into what task it must complete with a system. Now, naturally, we all speak very differently. We use idiomatic uh, ways of saying things. A lot of people use slang. People in the workplace will use acronyms for different things. So it has to be able to understand and recognize what someone is trying to say even if you and I would say different thing, the same thing in 10 different ways. Next, it needs to be under, able to understand context and it needs to be able to remember that context. In our world, we think about AI rich chatbots and context as being able to remember information such as personal preferences. Um, think about a travel bot that remembers that I like an aisle seat and I prefer to use my Marriott Rewards Vacation um, member information when I'm booking travel. Um, it could also have the ability to remember contextual information throughout a single session or conversation so that the individual isn't forced to repeat itself over time. There could be enterprise level contextual information that gets designed into a chatbot 
so that if you have a specific business rule, let's say when someone goes to book a trip and it's over a certain amount, that it remembers that it needs to trigger a certain process off of that. So A, chatbots to be intelligent need to understand natural language. They need to understand and be able to keep in both short and long-term memory contextual information. They also need to be able to consider human emotions when they respond to be able to use the emotions that people have to dictate what their next step or action will be. And last but not least, they need to be able to learn from their interactions. Every single interaction that they have with a person should be a learning experience because ultimately it's this intelligence built within the chatbot that is going to change our perception of the experiences we have with digital systems. It's what not only a conversational interface will make things faster and more intuitive because it's a conversational interface, but when you put this intelligence on top of it, it's what's going to make it feel much more human-like. It's, what it's, it's what's going to make us think of um, systems as being able to have two-way conversations versus a one-way interaction, whether the system is sending you something or you're asking the system to do something itself. The other piece that is important within AI-rich chatbots is, you know, we wouldn't fail to say that it's important for a chatbot to be able to understand and know when a real human should be, be able to get involved. So let's just take the IT help desk scenario. Um, if a chatbot came back based on, you know, three times of an employee trying to ask to, spit, to fix an issue um, and the person seemed to be frustrated, then the chatbot should be able to seamlessly hand that person over to a live IT help desk support staff so that they can help fix the issue without having to have the employee repeat all of the information that they already provided to the chatbot. So this is an important piece as well, whether you design the chatbot to be able to hand off to a live agent based on an emotional state or even based on business rules. Um, we do a lot of work with companies who are building chatbots in the IT help desk realm, and they'll say, well, for, you know, five specific types of problems, we know we don't want the chatbot to resolve that issue. They tend to be, you know, really high-level support things that, that a chatbot just won't be able to do in the beginning. So we want to automatically, if the request comes in for that type of issue, to trigger a live agent handoff. And again, sometimes it can be based on things like, frustration level of the employee or even in a customer scenario. So this is an imp important piece of, of what they do. When you think about a chatbot, another defining factor of a chatbot is that people should be able to interact with them 24 seven. So back to that IT help desk example, or even a customer support and customer service experience example, one of the big value propositions is that they're available when people need them even if, say, an IT help desk doesn't have support hours at that time. But people should be able to interact with them in a few different ways. A chatbot should proactively engage the end user when they see something that should be sent to them. A person should be able to on demand when they have a request, like pulling a report or finding a piece of information, be able to engage the chatbot. People should also be able to schedule times at which the chatbot engages with them to send specific information, say daily or weekly or monthly with reminders that are important to them as, as a, a person. And last but not least, let's talk about what chatbots can do. So you've got the, the point that chatbots create this conversational user interface. You've got the point that chatbots, if they're designed intelligently enough, can remember contextual information, they can learn from their interactions, they can process natural language, they can understand people's sentiments, people can engage with them in many different ways, but what can they engage with them to do? We break out what an AI-rich chatbot can do into five different buckets, and I would say these are ranging from very simple to more complex. So one, a chatbot can proactively send an alert to a person based off of a certain set of triggers. So let's take the example where a person in the IT help desk side um, submits a ticket for a lost phone. Well, that could trigger an alert to someone in the IT help desk to say, 
by the way, a ticket has been submitted for a lost phone, and even behind that alert, it could say, do you want to go ahead and wipe the person's device using your MDM solution? Second, a chatbot should be able to take action. Think of an action task as a data entry oriented task. Um, we internally use technology like Salesforce when we have to go in and you know, enter information about leads or about opportunities. Well, today in a traditional guided, um, G, in a traditional GUI interface, it takes quite a bit of time to enter that data. You have to scroll through the screen, you have to type in the information and step in different fields. The idea with an action task is anytime someone would have to fill out a form or enter a bunch of data, they should be able to do that through a conversational chatbot. They can do that in one of two ways. They should be able to say something like, um, I need to reset my password. And the chatbot can come back and in a ping pong like conversation, they should be able to collect all the information they need to be able to reset that password. Or you take something like the sales opportunity. I could, as a long form statement, just say, I need to update the gen tra gen track opportunity to close loss and a close date of December 15th, 2016. So in other words, I am making a long form statement in which the chatbot can parse the information I've given to it and only come back and ask me for the data fields that it needs. So you can imagine how much faster that would be if it's a single statement versus having to enter the data in seven different fields. The third thing that chatbots should be able to do is they should be able to pull information out of the system. Something like, get me a list of the outstanding POs that I need to approve. Get me a list of my top 10 opportunities. Tell me how much vacation time I have left to be able to take before the end of the year. All of that information should be able to, it should be able to pull out of the system and present back to the end user in a very concise, consolidated format. The fourth type of task that a chatbot can do is it should be able to answer questions, right? So I, I gave the example where I sorted through my own internal knowledge base to try to find that quote. If you think about IT help desk knowledge bases or HR knowledge bases where there's a wealth of information that oftentimes people have to search through, then once they find a document, they have to scroll through the document just to find an answer to a very simple question. Chatbots should be able to query different types of knowledge, whether that's structured or unstructured data, to instantly pull back answers to employees or customers' most pressing questions. Something like, what's the travel expense limit for client dinners? That shouldn't require you to go to a portal site then get into the travel and expense policy, then scroll through the travel and expense policy just to find that one piece of information that you're looking for. Really powerful. Last but not least, one of the more complex but most important tasks that chatbots should be able to perform is they should be able to be designed to power really rich business logic driven dialogues in which they can understand not just a single intent that someone says, but multiple intents. Let's imagine the case where an IT help desk staff member or employee says, I need to log a mass WebEx outage and why don't you try to reset the WebEx server at the same time so that they can get through the issue as quickly as possible. Well, it should know based on that, that each of those is going to trigger two different things in the system. To log a mass WebEx outage, that might need to be sent through the ServiceNow or another Service Desk instance to be able to log it, which then maybe triggers a communication to the entire employee base in a tool like Workplace by Facebook, where it says we're experiencing a WebEx outage. At the same time, it could trigger an API call to the WebEx server asking it to reset that server to see if it, it issues, it resolves the issue. So you can imagine a more complex dialogue or workflow in which the chatbot itself is triggering multiple communications to multiple systems to get something done that's really important to the operations of a business. 
So we think of these as what the chatbot can do. Just to give a couple simple examples of what I talked about, again, a chatbot could do something really simple, like requesting, um, taking someone's request to um, take PTO for a certain date, or sending them a notification when that PTO got approved. So in this case, we're showing within Workplace, and this could be tied to a chatbot tied to a system like SAP HR or success factors or Workday, where a person said, please send a request for PTO for this date. It parses that information, it puts the request into the system, which triggers an automatic movement over to the person's boss to say, will you approve that PTO? The minute that gets approved, it comes back, it comes back and right in that same workplace tool that people are using to communicate with their friends, they'd get a notification from you know, a tool like SuccessFactor saying, your PTO has been approved. They never had to log into a different application or get moved from the workflow that they're within for their general work. Back to the complex cross-system workflows and to stick with the HR example, you can imagine something like onboarding, a massive, massive problem for many of the largest enterprises where there's lots of different steps that have to happen for a person to get onboarded over a year plus period. But even think about on day one, where a person could get a, you know, a welcome note from you know, the onboarding bot in which it tells them the certain things that they need, need to do, and then explains that it can help them with multiple tasks, even across multiple systems through you know, going through a very simple process like what's being shown here to set up their benefits. But then it might be able to move from that to help them complete an I-9 form in a very simple fashion. So you can imagine all those things that oftentimes take someone six days before they can even start to talk to the people that they're going to work with. The ability to have a chatbot execute all of that across multiple different systems in a single process might take them an hour to actually get done. So real time savings and efficiency that come along with it. Just to show you a quick example, I mentioned that a lot of this can happen through natural language, typing, or through speech, but UI elements can also be incorporated in. I think Facebook as a company has done an excellent job of this on um, the messenger side as well with some of their carousels. But you can imagine in certain workflows, like creating a purchase order, where it's just going to be faster to incorporate buttons or a calendar or something that's going to make it easier than using natural language. Well, you have the ability to do that within chatbot. The idea of a conversational UI is that it's all still happening in that same conversational UI, in the same channels, but you're making the design of that conversation as fast and intuitive as it possibly can be for the person that's completing it, where they don't have a choice but to follow the business rules that your enterprise has put into place. So with that, let me move on to talk a little bit about some of the practical advice that we have. So I pulled this quote because, you know, if you read a lot of the Gartner research about the importance and this, this major paradigm shift that's going to happen, they brought up a good point, which is that the technology transition from one paradigm to another, like moving from cloud and mobile first to AI and conversational first, is typically disruptive, it can be costly, um, it's, not, it's not something you can avoid, and you know, eventually it will be worth it for companies. And we believe that to be true, um, especially in the arena of conversational AI-rich chatbots, um, but we don't think it has to be as complex, and, and that's part of what um, we're doing in collaboration with the workplace team to try to make sure that we're providing as much practical advice to enterprises that are really serious about moving down the path of conversational and, you know, the conversational and AI era. And there's three pieces of advice that we typically give with some very built-out tools behind this. First is you have to know where you're going to start and why you're choosing to start in one place versus another. Second, you need to understand the differences in the solutions that are out there. And this isn't a pitch for what we do versus others, but you have to understand that there's differences in platforms, in conversational services, in chatbot frameworks, and that's hard to recognize in a market that's as new as it is. 
And the last piece of advice is that you want to make sure that if you're building chatbots, that you're following a process that's acceptable to the enterprise, but also scalable in the long term. So let me walk through a couple of those lessons that we have learned and, and how we've come to some of that advice. So we've seen the perception, and this especially started um, in about uh, the summer of last year when we were very, very early in the market, where customers would come to us and they would say, look, the, the use cases are endless, and you know, we could really get started with any one of them at our company. Or they'd say, we just don't, we know we want to do this, but we don't know where to start. The reality is that not all of the use cases are created equal in terms of the ease and the effectiveness of starting with that use case, which means a lot of them are not necessarily practical for a company. So let me dive into that a little bit more detailed in terms of how we help people solve that problem of where do I start? Well, one, you know, we, we do know some of the common use cases that are being ap applied um, across different, um, different enterprises in many different industries, but also industry-specific cases. But ultimately, the companies that we work with, we ask them to go through an exercise internally to talk about what are your company-wide strategic goals? What are some of the highest priority workforce or customer initiatives that you have underway? Whether that's something like employee engagement, in which case some of the HR-related cases will be really important if hiring is a high top priority for them. Um, maybe it's also just about bringing millennials on board, which you can see relating over to something like the IT help desk because the current way in which people engage doesn't work. Maybe it's cost reduction. Um, what are the system-specific challenges that you face? Again, I talked about the fact that chatbots can actually make an interconnection between multiple systems, but they're also a way to modernize some of those traditional enterprise applications where the user interface is less than uh, desirable from an end-user perspective. So are there system-specific challenges? And then, you know, as importantly, what are the manual, costly, and or inefficient processes that you know exist within different functions in your business that you would really like to fix. Then we go through a process of that with them of trying to help them quantify the business value. When you think about those processes that may be weighing the business down, how many people do they affect? How many times a day do specific tasks that weigh people down get done? Um, how much time does it take to complete a task today? And what's the business impact of that current issue or task? So if you start to get to that point, then you get into the nitty gritty of what is the, what is your enterprise really ready to build a chatbot? You know, the big, the big piece of chatbots is do you, does the current system have an API to it? Because if it has an API, then you can build a chatbot with all the different tasks that I mentioned to modernize that interface and get things done for people. How clean is the data? Because if the data is a complete mess, then in, oftentimes a chatbot is not going to be able to solve that issue for you. Other things that people will think through in terms of enterprise readiness about which use case to start with is, you know, what does the timing look like? Who are the people that would need to be involved to make that use case a reality? What does user adoption in that group specifically look like? I'll give an example. We had a customer who came to us and said, we'd like to do a use case in a specific area, but the end users are, you know, are really going to struggle to adopt new technology. Well, you know, that's going to be a hindrance. And we might say, that might not be the place that you want to start. Um, and last but not least, compliance. Are you going to face a lot of obstacles? There's ways to deal with um, security and compliance if you have the right platform approach, but oftentimes people don't want to start with a thing that's going to naturally bring a lot of questions about security and compliance. So they think through all of these pieces, and we do an exercise called value qualification with people of what I just mentioned, where we go through and we look at those use cases and we look at the repetitive tasks that happen in a single system and go through a quantification exercise. Um, we look at the, the repetitive tasks that include multiple systems, and we look at some of the things that cross people and systems and try to quantify that for them. Second lesson, so moving off of selecting a use case that makes the most sense for your business, we get into a perception 
that there's hundreds of conversational AI-rich platforms to build bots. And the reality is, as I mentioned, that there's real differences in solutions, platforms, and conversation services. And our goal is to help educate people on what those differences are and to help them ask the right questions. One of the things that we've noticed this year alone in 2017 that didn't happen in 2016 is that there are RFPs out there for chatbot solutions. Well, what does that mean? It actually means that a segment of the market is getting much more educated on what they need in a platform because they've done early tests, often with some of the free technology, and have learned that there's huge challenges to come that will not allow that to be scalable if you don't have a true platform approach. I'll give an example of someone that I, I spoke with at a conference a, about a month ago, and it was a CIO from, from one of the largest global conglomerates, um, and he was from a specific division within there, and he said, you know, as a test, we wanted to build an Alexa skill for a ERP system. Well, that's fine. You know, you can go and you can do that, and you got something to work, but it was a single skill. The minute that they start thinking about how are they going to actually roll that out to all of their employees, how, what are they going to do if they want to build that skill for a tool like Workplace by Facebook or a website where they might want it to exist as well? Um, how are they going to deal with version control? All the kind of things that I imagine most of the people on the phone are very accustomed to from being in the enterprise software world are also going to be important when you think about the scalability of chatbots over time. Well, that's one of the major benefits of taking a different approach and taking a platform approach is that you need to think about, um, is it a complete platform? What are the development costs going to look like? How quickly will you be able to get to market? Because if you're looking at something like conversational services, you still have to construct the services together in order to then start designing what is the chatbot, what's it going to do, and how do I begin to test the natural language processing, whereas a full platform should give you the ability to really focus only on building the chatbot and what it's going to do, not on constructing the underlying solution needed to make that possible. Um, you need to look at things like accuracy of NLP and speech recognition. Do you have all of the very unsexy middleware that makes the chatbot able to respond very quickly, whether something is coming in one programming language versus another, and you need to process it and push it out into the channels that you've selected or using? Is it scalable enough to thousands of users? And what does security look like? Do you really have the things in place, such as encryption, um, authentication, authorization controls that will allow you to support a chatbot in a way that's going to be acceptable to the security and compliance team. So when you think about these, this proven approach that we go through with customers is we actually open the door and give them a complete tool so that they can ask the right questions. And we've been continuing to expand on this based on what we're seeing in RFPs. You know, what types of tasks can the bots, the bots that you're looking to build um, on this solution, whether it's a conversational service or it's a framework or it's a platform, can you support all those types of tasks? What, what does it look like to deploy in a channel environment? How will that work? If you're going to put something in Workplace by Facebook, but also going to put it in a place like on an internal website, it, are you going to build two different bots for that? Or are you going to build one bot and just extend it to the different channels and customize as you see fit? Can you deploy the entire chatbot solution in the cloud and on-prem? What does integration support look like? Because the minute you start to plug into all of those different enterprise systems, you want to know that you can um, make API calls with RESTful services, with OData, via SOAP. Can you support all those technologies? What does the NLP engine look like and the training? Is it only machine learning based? Because that requires a lot of training data. What do the developers to developer tools look like? Do they fit with your enterprise development model? What do the security and compliance features look like? And, you know, again, a very unsexy but really important piece. What does the administration tools look like? Can you manage the life cycle of the bot where if an employee asks for you to add an additional task or you see seven additional things that the bot could do, are you going to be able to easily add that 
and update and deal with version control just like you did with mobile apps in a seamless fashion. Really important questions that until this year, customers weren't necessarily thinking about. We give our customers a tool, which is you know, a tool that offers them the ability to look through the criteria for evaluating different enterprise bots platforms. I know that Gartner also has spent a lot of time putting together a similar type of assessment to say these are the type of capabilities that you need to go through and ask the vendors that you're considering working with whether they've got the capability to support that. So last but not least piece of advice was about making sure that you have a process that is scalable. So we have seen a perception um, with companies coming to us, again, particularly last year in early test phases where they said, well, any developer who can code can build a, a successful bot for the business. Here's the reality. Developers can easily build a bot, but the long-term success of that bot requires a totally different process than has ever happened before in the enterprise software world. And one of the things that I specifically talk about is my, my team in building out bots as a marketing organization with language expertise has had to get involved in making sure that the way in which the bot talks actually speaks to the way we want ourselves to be represented as a brand. So when you look at building bots, you need to involve the right people. There needs to be a sponsor that drives some of the use case discussions. You need to have a process process expert that can help define the specific tasks that the bot will perform and some of those workflows that may already be outlined that you want to turn into a specific workflow or conversational workflow. You need to have security experts that can be involved to help identify some of the known risks. Maybe the app developer understands the APIs and you know, gets involved with building bots and starts to develop some of that expertise. And then you might have a writer get involved to ensure that you've got the optimal conversation experience. You also need to consider your success metrics, be those financial metrics that the business cares about, business-related metrics, employee-specific metrics around satisfaction, or even metrics around IT. Are you simplifying some of the systems that are there? Or are you reducing things like the calls that come into the help desk? And last but not least, you need to ensure that you've got this process, every step of the process, from the start of picking the use cases to the end of managing that bot over time are covered. Making sure that you've got a way for users to provide feedback as well. So when you look at who to involve, this just reiterates some of those people. And if you think about the process, this is specifically what we walk through with our customers, a simple and repeatable process to start with, identify the customer or the employee use case, define the tasks your chatbot will perform, connect it via API to the enterprise system that matter, enable the natural language processing and go through that testing process all along the way, be able to deploy the chatbot to the desired users or groups, be able to measure the ongoing performance and results so you can tweak the natural language processing, build tasks off of it, and be able to manage that chatbot over time, changes and updates that are made centrally, but able to be deployed through things like Active Directory Sync to the user groups that need to get them across the channels that they would use them in. Really important. We offer a whole set of tools as well to our customers, some of which we're gonna send as a follow-up to this webinar, where you can go through the process of what do you use to get stakeholder buy-in? What are some of the checklists we should go through to make sure that we've got all of the pieces um, listed that need to happen to make this project a success or to make natural language processing a success? So in wrap up, before we take a couple of questions, we've got a number of resources. If you visit https.core.ai, you can get some of these resources. As I mentioned, we'll send a follow-up email to everyone with some of these specific resources we've put together, including a new use case guide that dives more specifically into examples across HR, across the IT help desk, within sales, within the supply chain and other service organizations, um, as well as some other areas that will talk to you more specifically about some of those use cases. The CIO kit um, itself, which sits on our website, will offer you more guidance into some of these individual resources to help you build a business plan. 
Um, and we continue to try to push out more and more information because the reality is we're all learning together through this process. It's a completely new market. And we, you know, really want to make sure that customers are, are successful along the way. And, you know, we think we can avoid, as I said, a lot of what Gartner said if we learn from each other and we push a lot of those lessons out to our customers in, in ways that you can consume. So thank you very much for your time today, and we'll go ahead and take some questions. Thanks, Lindsay. As a reminder, if you haven't submitted your questions, you can do so now uh, using the Q&A window, um, and we will take a couple. Lindsay, our first question is, what's the difference between vendors offering a chatbot platform versus a chatbot solution, such as a specific chatbot from a particular use case? That's a great question. So, you know, again, there's been a lot of confusion in the market in general. I mean, I think I talked enough about what, you know, what a platform is. I mean, a platform should be something on which you've got, you know, all of the components still in an open framework to be able to start instantly designing and building a chatbot from the ground up without all of the complexity of piecing the individual solutions together. That's what a platform is. There are companies with quote unquote chatbot solutions for individual areas, um, such as you know, a company that maybe has built a, um, an IT help desk chatbot. Well, that's a chatbot, but if there's no underlying platform behind that, then you think about the build of every single one of those instances for different enterprises is gonna to be totally different because all of the pieces need to be constructed back together based on what they're trying to do. So the platform is what would allow you to um, move faster. Now, we as a company have also created a bunch of out of the box bots for different solutions. And I'll use those as an example because we've got, say, a chatbot for something like the Salesforce Sales Cloud. Well, we've built 40 different tasks that that chatbot can perform, but the reality is that every enterprise's instance of Salesforce or a system like ServiceNow or any of the SAP systems are gonna look a little bit different. They're gonna be based on our own business processes and workflows and, and business rules that need to be applied. And so the value of that for us was to help people accelerate getting to market by giving them something, but oftentimes they'll, because it's built on a platform, they'll wanna use the platform to customize it, to extend it, to write in some of their business rules, to connect it with other systems. You know, if there's no platform behind that single out of the box solution, you don't really have the ability to do that. Um, so that, you know, that's what I see as, as the real difference. Again, if you're just looking to build a single chatbot, and that's all you ever envision doing, then maybe in some cases those could be okay. Um, but, you know, if, if you are like us, you know, and, and believe that, you know, the next interface for applications is going to be a conversational UI in the channels that people are already working, like Workplace, then, you know, the use cases really are, they, there are tons of them out there. Um, and as people get familiar with it, they'll build over time. And I, I think we see that as, you know, again, the benefit of a platform is the repeatability um, and the ability to get faster even at building chatbots as, you know, as, as you move over time versus just building single out of the box solutions for a single problem. Great, thank you, Lindsay. We actually have uh, some other questions, so we'll take a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the next one is, how do you define the difference between an AI bot versus a typical logical conversation bot? Great question as well. So, you know, I, I think if I, I go back to some of what I presented in there and why we like to define what we would, you know, say is an AI, AI rich chatbot is, you know, if, the, if a, some of the logical um, business process driven chatbots don't have any AI within them. And so, you know, questions to ask about something like that is they may be able to execute tasks, but 
can they really understand natural language, A? What are the natural language processing engines that they're using, or is it really just a rule-based system? Very, very different in one case or the other, because natural language, there is an understanding element to it. There's a learning element from that natural language that happens. You know, we use a combination of two technologies, something called fundamental meaning and machine learning. Um, but, you know, there's, if you think about things like the um, ability to answer questions off of structured and unstructured data, a rule-based system is not necessarily going to be able to do that unless they're programmed structured data or, or FAQs. Um, but it goes beyond that. I mean, back to being able to design contextual information to be remembered, being able to use things like sentiment analysis technology that measures you know, seven different emotional states to try to trigger different activity. Um, you know, being able to do things like that live, live person um, handoff. Um, all of these things, ultimately, you can design a rule-based chatbot, but when the experience we believe is truly gonna change for people is when those bots are designed to be smart enough that it's, it's gonna surprise people. It's gonna surprise people that they don't have to repeat themselves. It's gonna surprise them that the chatbot comes back and suggests that they do something instead of them having to reach out and you know, interact in one way. When it reacts off of their emotional state, I mean, that's something that we've never had engagements or experiences like that with software in, in the past. Um, that's, the, that's the value of intelligence in our mind is it really is gonna become it's not just about a conversational UI and a, you know, a, a faster way of doing things. It's a, you know, it, it's a whole different way of doing things where software can actually be helping us um, to get our jobs done instead of, you know, making us go to them and, you know, go to the system and, and adapt to it. Great, thanks, Lindsay. We're gonna take one last question and then we're gonna wrap up. So. Our final question is, is your platform built upon your own technology or do you use components from external providers? So um, we, you know, our, our approach has been um, from the get-go to build all of the technology ourselves. So, you know, the platform itself, you know, uses our own NLP engine, as I mentioned, two different technologies using machine learning and something called fundamental meaning. Um, we've built our own sentiment analysis technology that's not, you know, someone else's from another vendor. Um, all of the middleware is ours, all the security and compliance features. You know, the cloud-based version runs on AWS, um, and the on-premise version runs on an enterprise's own infrastructure. Um, but all of the components internally are, are basically ours. It doesn't mean, though, that we've, we have built the platform to be an API-based integration framework, which is what allows us to plug into different systems or even to plug into different tools. So you take the example of the live agent transfer, which we support within the platform. Um, we don't do live chat software, so we'd be handing over to you know, a live chat solution um, when the time is right from the chatbot to them seamlessly because we support APIs. So people will plug in other tools to our platform as well to enrich it, but the platform components itself are, you know, are all built by us. And, you know, we've, you know, believed that the advantage to that is that, you know, we understand the components, we know that they work together, we can make them work together more seamlessly, and we're not at the risk of, you know, a, another vendor service that has been constructed into a so-called platform that changes and, and we don't know how. Great. All right, well, that wraps up our uh, webinar. Lindsay, if you wanna close um, close the event out with any words, we can do that and then we're, we're all set. Thanks everyone for, for joining. Yeah, again, just a, um, a quick thank you to everyone for joining live and um, we look forward to, you know, continuing the conversation and a big thanks to the workplace team for all of their support as well. All right, that's a wrap. Have a great day, everyone.